God, as we gather in the sanctuary, we surrender, God, to your spirit that is present to give us strength. And now, God, as we break the bread of life, speak to us, God, by your spirit. Say, sinners, God, and strengthen the saints. Do it, God, until you are satisfied, until your kingdom is edified and Satan himself is horrified. God, we glorify your name and your presence in this place. Give us now, God, that which you know we need and that which you know, God, will bring glory to you. Bless and be with us as we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people of God did say amen and amen again. For a few minutes this morning, come with me to the lectionary text from Numbers chapter 21. In the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 21. There's a familiar story in Numbers chapter 21, but a story that for some reason, reading it this week and reflecting on it uh, last night, it spoke to my heart in a different way. And so the Spirit leads us on this day to Numbers chapter 21, beginning at verse number 4, I believe down through verse number 9, but, but I want to start reading at Numbers chapter 21, beginning at verse number 4. There we find these words. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go down to the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, saying, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. I like that. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God. Don't miss that. The people spoke against God. Don't miss that. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Well, what did they say against God and Moses? They said, why? Have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul hates this worthless bread. I'll stop reading right there. Let me tag this text and share from the subject, When God Claps Back. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. When God Claps Back. Some people are just hard to please. No matter what you do to them or for them, they're just hard to please. You work hard, they say you're doing too much. You take it easy, they call you lazy. You try to help, they say they don't need your help. Don't offer your help, and they say you're wrong for not trying to help. No matter what you do to them or what you do for them, some people are just hard to please. You cook them breakfast, and they say the bacon is not crispy enough. You give them a ride in your car. They say you're not driving fast enough. You recommend them for a job, and they say it doesn't pay enough. Some people are just hard to please. You ask them what's wrong, they accuse you of being nosy. You don't ask them what's wrong, they accuse you of not caring. You offer them advice, and they accuse you of thinking you know everything because some people are just hard to please. You make all B's and they respond, you should have made all A's. You clean up the whole house and they respond that it's not clean enough. You give it your all and try your best and they respond that your best ain't good enough. That was for the young people. Some people are just hard to please. You rave about the food at a nice restaurant and they say that the wait was too long. You tell them about a sale, about a discount, a hookup, or a lick, and they say it's not discounted enough. You sacrifice your time to spend time with them. You go without so they can go with. You stop what you
you're doing to go see about them. You ignore what you are going through so you can be there for them as they go through. You share your brilliance, your body, your bounty, and your blessings. And they got the nerve to complain that nobody is ever there for them. Uh, no matter what you do to them or for them, some people are just hard to please. They have a down for every up. They have a negative for every positive. They have a burden for every blessing. They have a problem for every solution. They have a didn't do for every did do. They have a nothing for every something. They got a question for every answer. They got a criticism for every congratulations. They got a complaint for every condition. And if you don't know any of these people, it may be that you are one of the people because complainers are everywhere. Complainers are always dissatisfied with something. Complainers are always annoyed at something. Complainers are always irritated or agitated by something. And they have no problem letting you know or anybody else know about it too. And the text that is before us today tells us that even God's chosen people, air quotes, even God's chosen people can be professionals when it comes to complaining. These are the same people who complained in Numbers chapter 11 and the Lord burned a part of their camp. These are the same people who complained about not having meat in chapter 11 and God said to them, if you want meat, I'll give you some meat. I'll give you enough meat to eat and that'll be all you'll eat. You'll eat the meat so much that meat will come out of your nose. Uh, these are the same people who in Numbers chapter 14 when they saw the inhabitants of the land of Canaan complained and said let's fire Moses and elect a new leader to take us back into Egypt instead of dealing with these giants. And because of their incessant complaining God said all of you complainers will not enter the promised land. Yet here we are again in Numbers chapter 21, and they are complaining. Isn't that what the text says? Verse 5 says, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. And what did they say? They said, why have you brought us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? We ain't got no food. We ain't got no water. I, I know that's bad grammar. We ain't got, but they had a bad attitude. They, they said, we ain't got no food, and we ain't got no water, and we ain't got th this bread, rather, that we do got. It is worthless. We, we hate the bread that we eat. We hate the manna that came from on high. Watch this, y'all. They were complaining to Moses in in the text, but they were talking about God. Don't miss it. God, God is the one who called Moses and told Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go because God heard the complaints and the cries of his people when they were enslaved in Egypt. God is the one who parted the Red Sea to bring them through on dry ground and closed the sea to drown Pharaoh and his army. God is the one who was the travel agent that picked the destination and planned the itinerary from Egypt into the promised land. And God was the chef who gave them the bread, the manna that fell from heaven that they now call worthless. So their words may have been directed towards Moses, but their real issue is with 
God. And I need somebody to understand today that people may be directing their words towards you and people may be sending the text messages to you and people may be raising their voice at you and people may be pointing their finger at you and blaming you and accusing you but their real problem is not with you their real problem is with God because God has not blessed them with what they wanted, who they wanted, where they wanted, when they wanted, why they wanted, or how they wanted it. So their real problem is not with you. Their real problem is with God. But people have a way of making their problem your problem. What I said, people have a way of making their problem, your problem. What well, I said, people have a way of making their problem, your problem. I'm still in the text. Verse 4, the text says they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and the soul of the people became discouraged along the way. They were tired of walking. They were tired of traveling. They, they were tired and had come a long way. They'd been moving for a long time. They did not like the sleeping arrangements. They wanted to be somewhere settled by now. They didn't realize that liberation lives at the end of a long street. They, they didn't realize that success and salvation are not at the intersection of Short and State Street. And so they were tired. They were discouraged and they had no problem making their problems known to Moses because people have a way of making their problem your problem, huh? People have a way of making their bad day your bad day. People have a way of making their being tired your being tired. People have a way of making their being angry your being angry. People have a way of making their being frustrated your being being frustrated. Freudian psychology calls it displacement. Displacement is when a person transfers the negative emotions that they have for one person or thing onto an unrelated person or thing. And while psychology may call this displacement, Big Mama simply says misery loves company. Is she right about it? Misery loves company. Miserable people love making other people miserable too because misery loves company meaning people can be in the same physical space as you, but they need you to feel emotionally as they do. People can be in the same physical space as you, but they need you to think mentally as they do. They need you to hurt spiritually as they do. They need you to struggle socially as they do. And that's why they bring their complaints to you. So in the vernacular of the millennial generation, the people were clapping at Moses in the text. To clap means to fire a shot intended to do damage. To clap is slang that comes from the sound that a gun makes when it is fired. The people were clapping at Moses in the text, not with guns or swords, but with their words. And sometimes words can hurt more than a deadly weapon. We ain't got no food, clap. We ain't got no water, clap. With mama, we, we don't like the manner. It is nasty, clap. This, I think, is where millennial women get the practice of clapping their hands with every word they say to prove a point. We ain't got no food, Moses. 
when women get that practice of clapping their hand. This manner is nasty, Moses. Women, millennial women, got a practice of clapping their hand and not to be a misogynist. But in the hood where I'm from, the brothers do it too. When a brother claps their hand like this while they're talking to you, they are doing this because they're trying not to hit you. Men and women know about the clap. The clap is a firing shot. It's aiming to hit you and to hurt you. And in the streets, if somebody claps at you, you always want to clap back. If they shoot at you, you got to shoot back. If they swing at you, you got to swing back. If they fire at you, you got to fire back. And surely that's what Moses wanted to do when the people in, in Israel come clapping at him and complaining to him. But before Moses could clap back, God clapped back. You get it? Before Moses could clap back, God clapped back. Be before Moses could clap back, God clapped back. I'm in the text. I'm in the text. I know we didn't read it, but I'm still in the text. In the text, after the people clapped, taking shots at the food and the water, verse 6, look at it. Verse 6 said, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. Well, what clapping back in the text is trying to teach us today, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. The text is trying to teach us that God is in charge of the complaint department. That's the first lesson I need to leave with somebody who has issues with complainers in your own life. You need to know, understand, and always remember that God is in charge of the complaint department. Because remember, the people were talking to Moses, but before Moses could respond, God responded. Did, did you hear what I said? Before Moses could clap back, God clapped back because God is in charge of the complaint department. I like that Moses worked in the communication department. He was the spokesperson whom God sent to Pharaoh in Exodus to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses even worked in the public relations department. He kept showing Pharaoh through the various plagues that God visited on Egypt that it was better to get along with God than it was to go against God. Moses worked in the HR department. He worked. He put together the severance packages for the children of Israel because when they left Egypt, none of them left empty-handed. Moses worked in the legal department. He went up onto Mount Sinai and came back down with the law that we call the Ten Commandments directly from God. Moses worked in the research and development department, making sure that the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant were built to God's specifications. Moses even worked in the finance department. He made sure that all the resources that the people brought brought was used and expended rightly. He even worked in the executive department, directing the movement of the people following the cloud that came by day and the fire that led them by night. All I'm saying is Moses worked in a whole lot of departments. Moses was seen as the leader, the chair, the heart, the president, the HNIC of a whole lot of departments, but when it came to the complaint department, God stepped in and said, Moses, that's not your department, that's my department, and I got this. And I hear God saying to somebody in the house today that you may become you, that you may become the couch for everybody's complaint. I hear God saying to you that 
that you may have become the chat room for everybody's choice words. I hear God saying to you that you may have become the pin cushion for everybody's criticism. I hear God saying to you that you may have become the target for everybody's trauma and everybody's trouble. But God says the complaint department is my department. You can work in the communications, but the complaint department is my department. You can work in public relations, but the complaint department is my department. God says you can work in the legal and the finance and the HR and the research and development, but God says the complaint department is my department. Because God says I can do some stuff in the complaint department that you can't do. Because all you can do is cuss and all you can do is fight. All you can do is go back and forth and do eye for an eye. All you can do is get mad and cry. But God said I can fix it so the very ones who are capping and clapping, cackling and complaining, I can fix it so that those ungrateful for people will never clap and never complain again. So step aside, Moses. The complaint department is my department. And I find it fitting that since these people had a problem with their mouths, look at the text. God sent serpents who had a problem with their mouth too. I'm still in verse 6. The Lord sent fiery. The Hebrew word is either aber, meaning winged, or aba, meaning breath. It's actually a term that is sometimes used to reference the seraphims, the angels who fly in the presence of God. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and everybody whom they bit got sick and they died. It wasn't everybody whom the serpents were biting, but they were biting the ones who complained. And I just came to tell somebody on today that you need to stay out of God's department because when you get into your habit of complaining all the time, you have moved into God's department. And if you want to have a prosperous and productive life or if you want to have life at all you ought to stay out of the complaining department listen we can talk if you want to talk but if you want to complain that's God's department we can pray if you want to pray but if you want to complain that's God's department I can give you advice if you need some advice but if you want to complain that's God's department and the text is teaching us on today that you better stay out of God's department. Is there anybody here who is glad today that God is the one in charge of the complaint department? I stop listening when you start complaining. I stop walking with you when you start complaining. I stop co-signing when you start complaining because God is the one in charge of that department. So take your complaint to the Lord and keep them away from me. Text tells us, the text tells us that when God claps back, you realize that God is the one who's in charge of the complaint department. But then the second thing that God, that the text tells us today is that when God claps back, God will deal with you while I just pray for you. That's what the text said. The text says when God claps back, God will deal with you and I'm just going to pray for you. That, that's what the text says. The text says when God claps back, that God will deal with you and I'm just going to pray for you. I'm still in the text. When the people realized that God was the one in charge of the complaint department, the text says they came back 
to Moses. And this time when they came back to Moses, they were not complaining. They were confessing. It's right there in verse 7. In verse 7, the text says they came to Moses and they said, Moses, we have sinned against God and we have sinned against you. Listen, my friends, there is nothing like some pain to give you a new perspective. That there's nothing like losing that helps you realize you should have listened. There is nothing like being knocked down that lets you understand that you could have always stayed standing up. But while God, the, the people come to Moses to confess that they have sinned against God and they have sinned against Moses. And when they go and confess their sins to God and Moses, look at what they say. They say, Moses, while God is mad at us, we know God listens to you. So Moses, will you pray to the Lord that the Lord will take the serpents away from us? That's the prayer. Pray to the Lord that the Lord will take the serpents away from us. And while the text does not explicitly say it, it does suggest that Moses did pray. Understand today, my friends, that we can never let what people have done to us keep us from doing the one thing that all of us can do. I'll make it personal. You cannot let the stuff that people have done to you stop you from doing the one thing that God has called you to do. You cannot let the fact that people have hurt you stop you from doing the one thing that God has told you you could do. The people came and said pray and the text suggests that Moses prayed. Moses did not pray that's what you get but Moses prayed God send some grace. Moses did not pray it's your fault but Moses prayed Lord have favor. Moses did not pray you caused me hurt but Moses prayed Lord we need your help and that's a different prayer from hurt them when you begin to pray help them. Moses did not pray punish them. Moses prayed preserve them and because Moses prayed the text says that God told Moses to make something. Make something that will be a sign and a symbol that I'm helping. Make something that will be a symbol to the people that I am with them in the midst of their suffering. Make something that will show the people that even though they have been bitten, I am in the midst and I can still bless. So the text says Moses made a bronze serpent, a bronze serpent, and as God instructed, Moses put the bronze serpent on top of his staff. He put the serpent on the staff and walked among the people carrying the serpent on the top of his staff. What are you saying, Bible? The Bible is saying that if you ever find yourself in a position like Moses, if you ever find yourself having to pray for people who complain, if you ever find yourself having to lead some people who don't always appreciate your leadership, you got to know how to hold something up. You got to hold something up so they can see that in the midst, the Lord is still good. The snakes were slithering on the ground, but God told Moses to hold something up. The snakes were still on the ground, but God told Moses to hold something up. And the thing that Moses held up looked like the thing that was on the ground. But what was on the ground could kill them. What was being held up? up was something to help them. What was on the ground could destroy them. What was being held up could deliver them.
them. What was on the ground caused them to suffer, but what was being held up would cause them to succeed. And what can you hold up? You can hold up your praise for somebody who needs to see it. You can hold up your word for somebody who needs to see it. You can hold up your faith for somebody who needs to see it. You can hold up your hope for somebody who needs to see it. You can hold up your testimony for somebody who needs to see it. You can hold up a prayer for somebody who needs to hear it. God said hold something up and there's something that God has already given that you can hold up. Here's how the hymn writer says it. The hymn writer says somebody prayed for me. They had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me and I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad somebody prayed for me. It was my mama who prayed for me. It was my daddy who prayed for me. It was the preacher who prayed for me. It was a missionary who prayed for me. It was a prayer warrior who prayed for me. I'm so glad that they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. And so then, and so then Moses, 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 he is the plea and praise on behalf of the people. But then third and finally, the text tells us that not only is God in charge of the complaint department, and not only will God deal with you while I pray for you. Third and finally, the text says when God claps back, that God still offers grace. Grace to get you through. Whatever it is you're going through. I say when God claps back, God still offers the grace to get you through. Whatever it is you're going through. Somebody ought to be happy in the house on today. Because the truth is that all of us have clapped. And all of us have experienced God having to clap back. But the reason why we are still here today is because when God claps back, God still offers the grace to get you through. Whatever it is you are going through. And so the Bible says that Moses had the bronze serpent on top of his staff. And he began to walk among the people as the people were still being bitten. The Bible says whoever had been bitten, if they looked up at the staff, they were healed of the poison that was in the snake's venom. The English says they looked, but the Hebrew says more than they looked. This look was not a mere glance at the serpent on the staff. This look was not a, a, a staring contest to see who would look, look, look away first. This look was not merely a, a passing thing that they did and were instantaneously healed. But the Hebrews suggest that when they saw the bronze serpent on top of Moses' staff, that they stared at it intentionally. They fixed their eyes on it without blinking. The text suggests that even though they were writhing and ringing in pain, they looked at the bronze serpent atop Moses' staff with a purpose. The same thing that was on top of the staff, it resembled the same thing that was lying on the ground. God did not take the serpents away like they asked Moses to pray. But in the midst of the fiery serpents still slithering and biting, God provided Moses with a bronze serpent that whoever looked at the serpent could find themselves being healed. And so I came to tell somebody that the very thing you think is destroying you is 
is just God's way of trying to redirect you. The, the very thing you think has come to kill you uh, is the very thing that God can use uh, in order to comfort you. The, those who looked at the image uh, began to find themselves feeling better in their body. The, those who looked at the image uh, found themselves surrounded by death, uh, yet looking at an image that brought them life. Uh, those who stared at the image, uh, they found themselves in pain, uh, but as they looked at the bronze serpent, uh, they found themselves receiving power. The, those who had been bitten, uh, they found themselves sick. Uh, but when they looked at the serpent, uh, they found themselves getting strength. And, uh, now, everybody who was there uh, did not choose to look at the serpent. Uh, some kept looking down. Uh, some kept laying down. Uh, some kept falling down. Uh, because the truth is there are some folk uh, who are comfortable with dying. Uh, but I came to tell you uh, that it may look like a snake. Uh, it may sound like a snake, and it may slither like a snake, but if you look up again, you'll see another snake. That's the source of your salvation, because in your waiting, God is teaching you patience. In your frustration, God is teaching you to walk by faith. In your irritation, God is teaching you inspiration. In your anger, God God is teaching you appreciation. In your struggles, God is teaching you strength. In the midst of your failures, God is still showing you favor. In the midst of your trouble, God is teaching you to trust. In your worries, he's teaching you to worship. In your problems, he's teaching you to praise. In your burdens, he still says bless him. In your foolishness. He's teaching you faith in your sin. He is teaching you salvation, but you will never learn the lesson that God is trying to teach if you keep on staring at the snakes on the ground. You will never get the deliverance that God has delivered if you keep on staring at the snakes on the ground. You'll never be healed like God said you could be healed if you keep on focusing on the snakes on the ground. But they had to stab at the bronze snake that Moses had lifted up. And I hear Jesus in the Gospel of John say that as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert of the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up from the earth. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me you may be tired but look up and live you may have been bitten but look up and live you may feel weak but look up and live you may be discouraged but look up and live you may be down but look up and live for as Moses lifted the serpent you gotta look up and see your lifted up savior there's power in the high and lifted up there's mercy in the high and lifted up there is forgiveness in the high and lifted up so stop looking down stop your complaining but look up to the hills from whence cometh your help look up to let mount zion rejoice look up to the throne room of god and watch god heal your body watch god cause the snakes to leave you alone watch god take your enemies and make them your footstool watch god open a door 
make a way. Heal your body. Save your soul. Watch God do what only God can.